Good morning, friends. Welcome to St. Margaret's on the third Sunday in Lent. It is my privilege to serve here at St. Margaret's in Washington, D.C. as the Associate Rector, and my name is Diana, Diana Gustafson. Um, I want to welcome everyone, whether you're here in the pews or whether you're out on Zoom. We are all part of one community, and I welcome you all together. I want to especially, especially welcome anyone who is new to St. Margaret's, and whether you are just visiting or whether you are looking for a permanent home, you are welcome here. If you are new, we would love to have you fill out a contact card, a connect card, and that's so we can learn a little bit more about you and see how we can serve you as your church, as uh, the Church of St. Margaret's. Um, everything you need is in your service bulletin. So all your prayers, all your hymns, and in fact, there's also a little QR code at the back. So I invite you to not be afraid to pull out your cell phone, use the QR code, and enter in some prayers that you would like to hear during um, our prayers of the people. And with that, I ask us all to close our eyes, to take a breath in, to center yourself in this place of common worship, to invite the Holy Spirit to be present to you in your breath, breathing in and breathing out.
Blessed be the God of our salvation. Who bears our burdens and forgives our sins. Jesus said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Most High, our God, is the only God. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God. God of all mercy, we, we confess that, that we have sinned against you. Opposing your will in our lives, we have denied, denied your goodness in each other. In ourselves and in the world you have created, we repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you all in goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. God is with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When Yahweh saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Then God said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said further, I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God of Isaac and Rebekah, and the God of Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. 
Then Yahweh said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I've also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is this God's name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. God said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God of Isaac and Rebekah, and the God of Jacob, Leah, and Rachel has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Sedienta de ti, Señor Dios mío, my soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. Mi alma está sedienta de ti, Señor Dios mío. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. O God, you are my God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. Mi alma está sedienta de ti, Señor Dios mío, my soul is thirsty. God. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live and lift up my hands in your name. Mi alma está sedienta de ti. Señor Dios mío, my soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. My soul is content as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches, 
Mi alma está sedienta de ti, Señor Dios mío, my soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you, your right hand holds me fast. Mi alma está sedienta de ti, Señor Dios mío. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. A reading from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, God will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, O Christ. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the power of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of the one who lived, died, and rose for us. Amen. Amen. Today's passage from the book of Exodus is by sure among the top ten most familiar and strange passages in the entire Bible. And it has such a rich history of interpretation. There's, of course, my grandparents favorite, Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments, starring Charlton Heston. And I have to tell you, I watched a little on YouTube yesterday, and the hair and makeup department outdid themselves. <laughs> After this scene, Charlton just comes down to find his wife and his brother, and this hair is just has all this life <laughs> after his encounter at the burning bush. The version of this story that was more meaningful to me, I was not really barely a kid, the Prince of Egypt animated version of this came out in 1998. I had already turned 18, um, but it feels like that film represents my generation. And having rewatched the scene that's depicted in today's passage, again on YouTube, yesterday, I noticed how the version of this animated film conveys so well because it's, it's more relatable, first of all, they don't render God's words in the King James Version. Um, but also, this version really brings to life what's going on here in the text, in the story. Because there's both a corporate action that God is taking here that relates to the overall history of salvation, but the film, The Prince of Egypt, does such a good job at conveying the personal struggle and component of Moses. So on the one hand, the corporate overarching history of salvation, as it's been revealed to us in the Bible, it's playing out here in this scene where God is fulfilling the promises that God has made to Moses' ancestors. If you were with us in church last week, you heard me preach about Abraham and Sarah. They are our forebears of faith. And they were called by God out of their experience of barrenness. And they set out on a pilgrimage of hope based on nothing other than what God promised them. And in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, God made three promises to Abraham and their descendants. One, that they would have descendants, that 
their descendants would number more than the stars in the sky that you could possibly count. Two, that they would be given a land, a place to belong, a home. And three, that their people would enjoy a special covenantal relationship with God. So on the one hand, here in this Exodus scene and in the rest of the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, God's promises to Moses' ancestors begin this process of fulfillment. And then on the other hand, there's this personal stuff, this very personal and individual narrative of Moses, who, though is an Israelite himself, was unknowingly adopted and raised as an Egyptian. He was raised in none other than Pharaoh's household, the king of Egypt. And as a result, he was spared from the experience of slavery and oppression which his people, the Israelites, suffered at the hand of the Egyptians. And it was only when, as an adult, that Moses ventured out of the palace that he finally came to see with his own eyes the suffering of his people that the Egyptians were causing. And so he fled. And where our story picks up today, he's out in the adjacent kingdom of Midian. And he's married by now. And he is now married to uh, the priest of Midian, who were shepherd family. And so he's out tending the flocks. I mention all this context because I think that these dual concerns of both the corporate communal story of salvation that's happening and the individual story of Moses they help us see how the Spirit is still speaking to us through this story, calling us, too, to a communal and a personal experience of liberation. So, to recap the story, and again, go rewatch the Prince of Egypt film, because there you'll see how a sheep escapes and so he wanders into this cave and and the whole pace of the story just slows down with real intention. And he sees this bush that's on fire, but it's not being consumed and he's just mesmerized. The first thing he does is he takes his staff and he sticks it in the flames to see what will happen. And he takes the staff out and it's not on fire. And reluctantly, he then places his hand in the flames, and it doesn't cause him any pain. And then we hear God's voice softly, like a whisper, Moses, Moses, here I am, he responds. And here in the film, they go out of order, but I think it's so effective. He says, remove your sandals, for the place you're standing on is holy ground. And then they show in slow motion how the pebbles on the ground are swept away by the wind. Moses responds first by saying, who are you? And the Prince of Egypt film gives us the climax of the story at the very top. I am who I am. I am the God of your ancestors. And it's as if because God revealed God's identity, Moses too was confronted with his own identity. So the film does these flashbacks of voices when Moses was discovering who he was, though he had been raised by the Egyptians. It's revealed to him that he is a Hebrew. He is one of the family of those who are being oppressed outside the palace walls. Only then does Moses remove his sandals. And as the film keeps going through this story that we've read in the text, they continue to interweave both the communal concern of what God is doing here and the personal story of Moses. First, there's this, this lament that happens, because Yahweh says, I have observed the misery of my people. I have heard their cry. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians. 
to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The most important three verbs here in this part of the story is that God sees their oppression. God hears the Israelites' cries. God knows intimately their pain. And this initial impetus for God's response is evoked by the Israelites crying out. It's their tradition of lamenting to God, to being honest with God, that serves as this catalyst of God responding. And then the personal of Moses comes in because as Yahweh announces that God sees, God knows, God hears, Moses too is seeing and hearing and knowing the pain and the suffering that he has been spared. And it shows these flashbacks of Moses encountering the suffering of his people for the first time. It shows the flashbacks of Moses killing an Egyptian soldier and then fleeing and running away. So not only does God see, hear, and know the people's pain, God also will not let Moses away, look away from the suffering, or relinquish his personal responsibility to do something about it. Then the story ends with this response to God's call for Moses himself to be an agent of liberation. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And so beautifully read by Annie, you heard the you emphasis. I will bring you. And in the text we have today, it's, it's a shorter version if you read the rest of the chapter. Right here we have the first two of five objections that Moses is raised, raises with God. Here are just the first two, but Moses does this back and forth with God five times, coming up with everything that he can think of to convey to God that, no, I'm not your person. This is not for me. But God insists that I will be with you, and I have chosen you to do this. Which brings us to how this applies to us today. I hope you're seeing how, how these two aspects of the story, the corporate and the individual, help us encounter this story too in ways that, in which we can see the communal call to participate in liberation and our own individual call from God. God sees, hears, and knows of the suffering and pain of us today. Like the Israelites, our cries and our laments evoke God's attention. God sees the systemic oppression of the people in our own time. God hears the cries of those in pain, like the people of Ukraine who find themselves in the midst of war and violence. God knows intimately that Pharaoh's economy of extracting from the people more and more, that that value is still alive today. God knows intimately the pain of those who suffer the most from that economy and from our collective unwillingness to embrace an economy of neighborliness and generosity. But there's also a way that this text is speaking to each of us here today. Individually, God calls to us to be agents of liberation. Yesterday, about 30 of us gathered here in the pews and online to conclude a many month long, 10 session long journey of examining race and racism. It's a program called Sacred Ground that 30 or so of us have been journeying on since last October and we came together um, to 
to mark the ending of, of that phase of our work at least. And we reflected on what have we learned and what do we feel called to next? Among the learnings that we kind of cataloged and tried to put into overarching themes is that the problem of race and racism is way worse than I thought, right? That was one of my realizations, that I thought I knew something about how our country is systemically wrapped up in this story of how we've systematically othered people. But it's way worse than I thought. It profoundly punctuates every aspect of our history. And another learning, that good intentions are not enough. So white people, people socialized as white, like Moses, cannot flee. We cannot flee from our complicity in participating in these systems. And we cannot look away. We cannot look away from the prejudice and the bias and indeed our own racism that is unavoidable because it's in the air we breathe and the water we drink. God's revelation to us of our ancestors is a reminder of the evil that though we may not own slaves today, some of our ancestors did. Both communally and individually, God calls us to be agents of liberation, my friends. And so following what the story here in Exodus reveals, there's three things that we can do. One, expect God to be a mystery. Expect God to show up in these mysterious moments and places, these unexpected experiences in our lives, like the burning bush. Do we pause long enough to listen to the voice of God, calling us each by name? Do we take off the sandals from our feet to stand on holy ground? Do we make space in our lives on a daily basis outside of coming to church on Sunday to pray, to experience God in nature, in a loved one, even in a stranger? The second task is to take part in lament. Are we telling the truth to ourselves and to God about the pain that we and others are experiencing? Do we honestly tell God, not, not conclude that, oh, the messiness, that's not for God, I'm not allowed to complain to God, but to come honestly to prayer and participate here in a communal sense of crying out to God to evoke God's attention in our need, our continuous need for liberation. And third, to take action, to respond to this call that God places on each of our hearts. What bold and holy desire has God placed on your heart? What is God inviting you to let go of, thereby liberating you from your personal despair or how is God calling you to take part in a communal action, whether it's here at St. Margaret's through our many ministries or in some other communal context that you're a part of, taking part in a group effort in pursuing justice together? As you do these three things, to encounter God, to lament, to take action, Remember that they're not all done at once, and they're not all accomplished in this life. And remember that Moses objected five times, and it's expected that we will have doubts. It's expected that we will fail. But hear the words that God spoke to Moses. I see, hear, and know your pain and I will be with you. Amen.
Please stand as you are able. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of male and female and in between. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the poor, tortured and nailed to a tree. A man of sorrows, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth to the place of death. On the third day, he rose with the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving to the church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of eternal life. Amen. Please kneel or sit for the prayers. We pray to Christ for courage to give up other things and to give ourselves to him this Lent. Give your church the courage to give up her preoccupation with herself and to give more time to your mission in the world. We pray for our own Charlie's Place ministry, for our Afghan refugee ministry, and for all outreach ministries in every church. May the blood and water flowing from the side of Jesus bring forgiveness to your people and help us to face the cost of proclaiming salvation. Christ, meet us in the silence. Give, Give us strength and hear our prayer. Give your world the courage to give up war, bitterness and hatred, and to seek peace we pray for the people and places affected by armed conflict in every place, from Ukraine, Syria, and Afghanistan, to Myanmar, Mexico, and Yemen. May the shoulders of the risen Christ, once scourged by soldiers, bear the burden of political and military conflict in our world. Christ, meet us in the silence. Give us the courage to give up our selfishness as we live for others and to give time, care, and comfort to the sick, including the following members of our own parish family, Leo Curran, Sharon Dove, Isabel Malise de Hospital, Mackenzie Keller, Kate Blackburn, Carlin Rankin, Ed Gamber, Ron Lorenzen, Rhonda Williford, Bert Russ, Ashley Anderson, Ray Reinhardt, Pat Hines, Diana Wright, Amelia Early, Kimberly Rankin Imperial, Edith Scott, Marcelina Maynard, and Michelle Brito. May the wounded hands of Jesus bring his healing touch and the light of his presence fill their rooms. Christ, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. Give us the courage to give up our fear of death and to rejoice with those who have died in faith. Especially we hold in our minds those known to our members of our community who have recently died. May the feet of the risen Jesus, once nailed to the cross, Walk alongside the dying and bereaved in their agony, and walk with us and all your church through death to the gate of glory. Christ, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. And continuing with the prayers submitted by members of our community, there is thanksgiving for spring and the rebirth of the earth. 
Let us pray for compassion and an end to war and suffering all over the world, especially in Ukraine. We give thanksgiving for the family of St. Margaret's community. Let us pray for Gloria Quito Lewis, Peter Quito, Modesta, Raul, and Carlos Gonzalez. O oh, Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us peace and unity of that heavenly city where the Creator of the Holy Spirit may live, the Holy Spirit, where in the, sorry, where with the Creator and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. God be with you all. We now move from the liturgy of the word to the liturgy of the table to our altar. Everybody is welcome to come up to receive communion. We would welcome anyone, whether you have been received within the Episcopal Church, whatever your background is, you are welcome to come up and receive communion. If you prefer to have a blessing, then let Richard or me let Richard and me know by putting your hands over your chest, and we would be very happy to give you a blessing. If you prefer not to have a gluten wafer, then just say ask for a, a gluten-free wafer, and we'll be happy to give you that as well. We now come to the time of offering, and as we begin to lay the table for our meal. We want to pause to offer back something of the abundance that God has given us. If you are visiting for the first time, please don't feel under any obligation to give into the plate. However, we would love for you to give some little information about who you are so we can tell you more about St. Margaret's and learn more about you. And the blue cards should be in the, front, be in the pews in front of you. If you do give, know that what you give is to the mission of St. Margaret's. And I think it's worth repeating every time we come together what our mission is, which is to proclaim gospel justice in our broken world. It is to serve others, worshiping, including our, exper experience, including our neighbors experiencing homelessness, and it is to sustain our diverse and varied community and to include everybody within it. So with that in mind, we ask you to please give generously. Now let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to God. Ah, the tree. Our beautiful, beautiful tree. So this is our Lenten tree. It started out with no blossoms on it. And each week of Lent, we have come and we have taken a blossom and pinned it to the tree. And each blossom represents something that we have done in support of creation care. Our mission, our giving up, or our taking on this Lent has been to give up single-use plastics. So take in your mind something that you have done this past week or a prayer that you have prayed and bring that up, put it in your mind, attach it to the blossom, and then pin the blossom to the tree. If you are not here, if you are with us in Zoom, there is a link um, that you can press, and then we ask you to add your prayer there. Or we ask you to add, to add whatever it is that you have done this week, what you have held in your heart as we support the creation that God has given us. Amen. Thank you.
May God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Most High, our God. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and foundation of mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who was tempted in every way as we are, you did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for Christ, who died for us and rose again. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We could not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, Jesus revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that those who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us with the everlasting heritage of your children, that with blessed Margaret and all your saints, past and present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray, each in our own language, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ lived, died, and rose again for you, and feed on him in your hearts through faith with thanksgiving. body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Please join me in the prayer after communion. O Jesus Christ, you have taught us that we do for the least of our brothers, sisters, and siblings. We do also for you. Give us the will to be the servant of others as you were the servant of all and gave us your life and died for us, but are alive and reign now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for announcements.
Good morning. I'm Mike Armstrong, your uh, elected senior warden. And I'm Annie Elliott. And uh, Annie and I are two members of the Vestry, which is the elected church council. And we just want to say welcome to all of you. Uh, those of you that are newer to St. Margaret's, uh, perhaps have only been here a few times or this is your first time, we encourage you to take a look at the Connect cards that are uh, hanging on the back of the pews. Take a moment to tell us more about you so we can get to know you better. We also invite you to take a look at the announcements that are in the back of your bulletin. There's a lot of information in there. Um, and I believe the people you need to look for, if you would like to speak with one of the people in charge of, those, um, of some of those activities, so Jim Walford is here. There's Patty Nicholson, and Tad Johnson is here for Charlie's. What? Oh, sorry, I thought I saw you there, Patty. There's a look-alike in the, in the audience. Anyway, and if there are any other members of the vestry here, could you please stand? Ah, oh, okay, not many today, all right. <laughs> okay. Great, so you may speak with any one of us after the service if you have questions or um, any thoughts to share with us. Those of you that are here in, in uh, the nave, we invite you to come to our coffee hour and spend a moment uh, talking and getting to reconnect with each other. And again, any questions you might have online, our online participants have their own virtual coffee hour, and I know that they're posting information around the Connect information. So again, welcome and thank you for being here. I'll stay with me. Um, I want to talk to you about masks. Well, Mike is still here. Um, so for four consecutive weeks now, I would note that the, the transmission rates of COVID-19 in our city have been at the lowest level, um, according to the CDC metrics. Um, and in relaxation with the guidelines from the CDC level, our mayor and the bishop, um, the wardens and I have mutually agreed that as of next Sunday, we'll be shifting to masks being optional in worship. Um, I don't know that that's need to applause because I, I want to hasten to, to name a few things. Um, we need to continue exercising good judgment about the sensitivity of, of your time here at church. Be practical and read the social cues of one another. There are many, as you saw with the eagerness to applaud, there are many who welcome this news and there are some who um, might be discouraged by this news. Um, so we ask uh, that if you choose to continue wearing a mask, know that we support you. And if you choose to worship without a mask, know that we support you. Um, masks will continue to be available in the back of the nave upon request. Um, and I was, I was struck by something that the Bishop of New York put in his statement to the Diocese of New York, um, that these easing of restrictions that we're all experiencing both in our lives outside and even now here in church, um, it doesn't mean that COVID is gone, right? We, we know. Rather, it signifies that we're entering a phase in which we learn that COVID is going to be with us and we have to learn how to live with it um, as safely as possible. So know that we are obviously going to continue watching the trends of case rates and deaths, both internationally, um, the other variant we're aware of, um, and we want to hear from you, right? Uh, this does not be, need to be the end of the conversation. Um, Mike in, is available by email, phone, grab him. I am today. Jenny Carson, our junior warden, couldn't be here today, um, but she is, is very happy to receive your phone call um, or email as well. Uh, so that's the latest on masks as of next Sunday. We're going to shift to that change. Thank you. I'm Jim Wolford, one of the coordinators for our efforts to partner with the Nahib family as they establish their lives in this country. If you were here last week, you heard Penny talk about the delightful visit she and Kathy and Anamita had with the family, um, meeting some very resilient and generous women. Kathy and Anamita went back this week and came away from that visit with a couple tubs of homemade yogurt. And it's becoming evident that that yogurt is one of the least of the blessings we're going to have through this experience, and I hope many of you can be part of it. There is information in the bulletin about how to volunteer. 
I want to do a special plea for drivers, people who can provide transportation to visits during the week. We have eight of us signed up, but I'd love to have 15 so that we can spread the, the workload, and also so that at any given time, there might be at least one of us that's available to do that. So uh, contact me or go to the web page to sign up. Thank you. As Richard alluded to in our sermon, we had a really powerful meeting today with the 30, roughly 30 members uh, of our congregation and a few uh, who joined us, in with us talking about sacred ground and talking about race uh, through the course of American history and racism as it exists now in America. We want to bring you some of those learnings to share with you some of our stories and to share with you some ideas we have for moving forward as a congregation. So we're going to be doing that next Sunday at a noon forum, and I invite you all to come and to hear what a large portion of our congregation has learned, what we found from really bearing, uh, digging deep into ourselves, and what our ideas are for moving forward. So please join at noon. That's going to be available here uh, on the pews, and also on Zoom. And then finally, or secondly, uh, as you know, it's Lent and we've been really focused, thank you especially to Patty and the Creation Care Group on giving up single-use plastics and really thinking about God's creation and how we can work to heal God's creation. So each week, a member of our congregation has been talking about their journey, how giving up single-use plastics has affected them and uh, have brought a story. So this week, I invite Richard Villanay to come up and um, uh, speak to us for a few minutes on uh, his, his story of uh, work with Creation Care. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Diana, and uh, thank you all. Good morning, so happy to be here with you all. And another shout out to Patty Nickerson, who started our Creation Care group and um, the wonderful work that we hope to achieve in the coming days and months. Um, for me, uh, it really started as, a, as I've you know, gotten older and I've thought about the climate, the climate change, global warming, um, and the real effect that it's having, not just here in the US, but all over the world. And like, what, what could I do to be a part of, to, to help, um, to help raise awareness about it and to help address it, alleviate it in whatever ways we, we can as human beings and individuals. And it seems daunting, and it really is, because there's so many different aspects to this that you can approach um, uh, climate change, global warming, and how we can really do something about it. So it started as you know, recycling, um, composting, uh, my wife is an advocate, <laughs> um, is, is she, she's been doing it for years, even well before we knew each other. And so um, that's something we do in our household, uh, talk about the um, buying in bulk, things of that nature, things to help uh, alleviate the use of, of plastic and help us get to zero waste. And all those individual actions are very important and they're a necessary first step. But I've always come to believe that collective action is the best way that we can address issues of this world. Very difficult issues, issues that there are, um, although on this one I feel like it's fairly straightforward what the issue is and what the resolutions are, although other people, there's differing opinions. But one of the ways I learned over this last year um, was through action with the Sierra Club, Washington Interfaith Network, um, and um, uh, Washington Interfaith Power and Light we, they, it started in February of 2021, where I was able to join with other in, um, individuals, and we went around the district at the various wards, all eight wards in various neighborhoods, and we started to do gas leak detections. And I was, had never heard of this. I was just like, okay. <laughs> they asked me, and I was like, yes, I'd like to learn. So we really just took this small um, 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 gas leak machine, and we went around, and we were detecting gas leaks at various access utility um, caps throughout the, the city. So you see them on sidewalks and on street. 
Um, they often will say Washington Gas or um, the various names of the, uh, of the utility companies that put in these pipelines. So what we did was we went to the vents and we used this machine and we would record um, the measure of gas that was emitting from these, from these, uh, from these pipes and these, and these vents. And what we came to find was that over and, and uh, over three, almost 400 leaks, over, over, over 400, almost 400 leak detections where we were able to measure the amount of gas, methane gas, that was uh, emitting through these, through these utility pipes. And in some of them, uh, at, least, at least 14 of them, there were the, the gas leaks were measuring at a level which would cause an you know, explosion, a fire. It, it, and it was just very like alarming to us as it going around just you know, doing this research and then uh, individuals on the street would come up to us and say, oh, what are you doing? And we'd talk to them and they'd be like, oh my goodness, what? And so it was just a very interesting, both to learn and to engage with others, you know, uh, others uh, who had never met before, but who came together for this common cause, right? Of wanting to know what can we do? Despite, as I mentioned, how daunting climate change is, what can we do about it? So then the culmination of this research um, was on February 23rd, we were able to, myself and um, at least 20 others on this one topic alone, were able to give testimony before the Committee on Business and Economic Development of the DC Council. Uh, that is chaired by Council Member Kenyon McDuffie. And he was present and so was Brooke Pinto, who also represents this ward, Ward 2. And so um, we were able to give testimony about why this is so alarming and, and, and why we need to address it. Because as more is coming out, especially with gas appliances in our home, you learn that the harmful effects that it has on aggravating respiratory systems, and including uh, the potential to cause um, uh, lung infections. It, gas appliances have, a, there's a 42% increase for, uh, of asthma in individuals who live in homes with gas appliances. There's also the issue of child, childhood development and the, and the um, and the IQ, um, the, 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 the effects it has on IQ and de uh, developing and learning. So through this testimony, we kind of shared our personal stories. Me as a, as a, as a father of an 18-month-old, um, very concerned for her future, the future of our, our us, our children, the future, you know, it, it, it touches all of us in a way that is very alarming and, 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 and again, needs to be addressed. So through this testimony, we're trying to work to tell the DC Council, hey, here's some research, what can you do about it? You know, um, understanding that uh, the utility companies, they have you know, their own interests and wanting to kind of replace the pipes and what we were advocating for, at least in my personal opinion, was like, well, no, we need to address a new model because replacing the pipes isn't gonna, isn't gonna help affect the fact that, yes, you might be able to affect, um, replace the pipes and, assuage or lessen some of these leaks. But the underlying issue is, is this the best model moving forward? Especially as we think about all the harms that we've come to learn about climate change. And so through that, that collective action, we gave this testimony and we're asking DC Council, please consider this and do something about this. And so I, I shared that story because it was a, is a way for me to meet other people, learn about, to le be informed about an issue that probably doesn't get as much attention, and then also, what can we do about it, right? And, and, that, and that's the way, you gain data, you speak to council members, those in power, and you ask them, hey, what do you wanna do about this? Because this not just affects me, it affects you, it affects your family, it affects your friends, it affects future generations. And the importance of, of, of raising awareness around that is key to gain action, because people will, you know, when you start to see how it touches you individually, you really then start to understand um, this is not just about me, this is about my children, this is about my friends' children, this is about my family's children and all of that. And it's a very important um, part piece of the way that we can help uh, raise awareness around climate change. So with everything that we're doing here at St. Margaret's, with single, trying to get to zero waste and reducing plastic use, uh, I, I, we, those are very important and it's very key to the, the, that first part, raising awareness as an individual. I myself, I've gone into stores and uh, take out and give my containers and you might get certain looks at the time. Some people are like, what? Uh, especially with COVID, but they'll do it, right? 
And those are just one, one way, buying in bulk, the composting. There's, and we shared some resources, the Creation Care team has shared some resources on other ways in which we can help in terms of um, uh, reducing our use of plastic. I would just also ask, as, as individuals as well, if we can also, that collective action piece of it, and, and what uh, opportunities to, to be a part of that collection as just to raise your voice in terms of your experiences or to hear about others' experiences. And so um, today, uh, to this evening, afternoon at 3 o'clock, um, uh, when the Washington Interfaith Network is having a uh, public action rally uh, with various um, candidates for mayor and attorney general at 3 o'clock today. Um, it's an opportunity to hear about some of their positions on immigration, climate change, um, various issues, but climate obviously being the one forefront with this discussion today. Also on the 24th of March, this upcoming Thursday at 11 a.m., the chairman of the Public Service Committee, so again, the Business and Economic Development, they oversee the Public Service Committee. Uh, at 11 a.m., their chairperson, Emil Thompson, is gonna be holding a, a discussion with the DC Environmental Network. Um, so uh, if you're able to look this up or if you'd like the link, you can reach out to me. I can share with you to register and to hear about how the Public Service Commission is, what they're doing with some of this new, the, the, the report that was released, how they're addressing um, other areas that the, the district council, the DC council has, uh, has, um, has noted as of ways that they wanna target and address global warming. Uh, and so those are, uh, uh, those are ways in which we can get involved. Um, if you're able to, please join and continue to continue and, and to please continue the good work that we started here in Lent and probably many have done before to continue to address getting us to a place of zero waste and reducing our use of plastic. Thank you very much. I must apologize because I forgot one important thing. If Maya, Maya King, would you wave and stand and be acknowledged? This sadly is Maya's last Sunday with us. Maya has been a member of our community for a couple of years after graduating from Howard. Um, and she has landed a job um, as a correspondent for the New York Times. And so she's headed to Atlanta, actually already is in transition and will be following around Stacey Abrams and seeing what happens you know, politically in Atlanta. So we send you with our love and our prayers and please give her those love and prayers during coffee hour today. God bless my Please stand for the blessing as you are able. May holy wisdom who makes all things new enter our souls and make us friends of God through Jesus Christ. The blessing of the triune God be upon you, source of all being, incarnate word and Holy Spirit, be with you all and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.
go forth in the name of Christ. Christ.